Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to another episode of Island Spot Sports. And before we get to our guest today, we have a big shout out for, for Living Sisu. Living Sisu is a platform and app that wants to give you all the tools to have success in your sport. Their main objective is to activate your lifestyle. So for active, it's for active people. Enjoy discounts at, at companies like BioSteel, 30% off, Body Logics, The Goalie Guild, all his books are discounted. Roan, Lululemon for men. 20% off online stretching programs with eccentrics, one full month free. They got super silent massage guns, 20% off those. And it's a great quality. It's way less expensive than a Theragun. And it's a great, it's great quality. So there's so many more discounts that you guys will need to just become a member to see. So they want to provide you with anything you need for success. So come join the community. I'm a part of it. A bunch of other athletes are a part of it, so it's free to join. It takes 20 seconds to have to get exclusive offers to your sport, and it's definitely worth worth it. So, do do us a huge favor and go sign up for Living Sisu's membership. It's free, 20 takes 20 seconds, so go do it, and we'll see you there. Living Sisu is a great company. We uh we know one of the co-founders, Zach Fricali. He's a great guy. He uh. He's the co-founder, and he does a lot of live streams on Instagram at uh, at Living Sisu, and with a bunch of elite athletes. And you learn a lot from like the athletes' determination, the resiliency, everything to what me made them become successful. So it's been a great experience so far. So go on. I'm gonna leave uh, the link in the description. So uh, go sign up. Yo, welcome back to another episode of On the Spot Sports. I'm Jack, and in today's episode, we have a very special guest, current college goaltender Ben Pat. Ben is a current college hockey goaltender playing in the NCAA with University of Minnesota Duluth. Ben has spent the last four seasons at UMD and is entering his grad year, so he's gonna. So it's gonna be his fifth year. So he played juniors in the SJHL and the MJHL for junior hockey. So this is gonna be a fun episode. Excited to get you on, Ben. So welcome to the show, Ben Pat. Yeah, Jack, thanks so much for having me. Uh, big fan of On The Spot Sports. So uh, I look forward to having a conversation with you, man. Look forward yeah, to it. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's going to be going to be a lot of fun. So to, think, to start things off, like, how have you been? Like, I know you said that you're starting first day of school just like I am today. So how's, how's everything going with that? Yeah, everything's well. It's, you know, we're excited. I know when I say we, I mean the team, I mean, you know, the whole community, everybody right now, I think the world too, a little bit of normal, uh, getting back into a classroom and, and getting back into, you know, practices and games where we, you know, we're hoping to have fans again and have a normal, normal year and, you know, in the quotations, but um, so I think there's really good morale around everywhere. The feelings are are high and happy of seeing other faces and seeing people again. So for that reason, all is well, you know, get back into the swing of things. Everybody's back from the team for summer. So we're getting into workouts and some testing this week, but, uh, but getting back on the ice, getting back in the gym and, and getting prepared for another big season here. Yeah, that's unreal. It's like, what have you been doing this off season to help prepare for this season? Just, help you guys do big things once again, because UMD is a, a fantastic organization with a lot of success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of, you know, we've stayed on the ice pretty consistently. A lot of the guys here, we feel like, you know, it's, it's, we're big believers that it is important to take a little bit of a mental break, which we all, which we all usually will for a little bit, but we also believe it's, you know, harder to get back in shape than to stay in shape. So a lot of us kind of stuck around the area and we had a good group of us skating. We have a lot of um, NHL alumni that come back and they skate through the summers with us. And that really raises, you know, raises the bar of, of the intensity and the tempo, which helps a lot of us. So we've been skating pretty often, you know, a few times a week and then working out almost every single day together as a good group. So we've kept that going and now we're just ramping that up with the coaches getting back on the ice and uh and the feeling of the season itching around the corner everybody raises their game a little bit oh yeah it's, it's a fun time when season's right around the corner and you guys are just the boys are buzzing like yeah, there's, no, there's no better feeling and just you're you guys are you guys are ready for the season ready to get this thing started yeah absolutely when everyone gets back there's uh it, it's a really good time these first few weeks and you know you bring freshmen in every year now me being in my fifth year we have a we have an older group too. So I, I had a large freshman class. We lost, you know, four, 
five now to the NHL, but the guys that have stayed, all of us came back except for one. Uh, Nick uh, Sweeney signed with uh, with Minnesota in the wild. But we have, you know, four or five 50-year guys um, that's made us one of the older teams. But, but so we love getting the freshmen in here, having some team bonding stuff going on. It's it's good. Yeah, and, like, bringing in with that fifth, the fifth year students like you guys have a lot of experience and everything so like how do you think that's going to benefit the team especially with you guys have been playing for five years now oh absolutely I think you know and we've seen so many scenarios like we're our year um who are now you know the super seniors or whatever you'd call them but you know we've been able to win two national championships we've been in you know we've been in the frozen four every year we've been here you know it, it's that it's that understanding and that environment, that expectation that that's where we're going to go. And, you know, last year losing to UMass in the semifinals after, you know, two years before that beating them in the national championship while Kel McCarr was there and, and all that, it, it was, uh, it was a tough pill to swallow. And I know a lot of us still feel sour about it. We thought if it was a regular year, I think we could have given them a little bit better of a run than, you know, it was an overtime and it was a good hockey game, but you know, we're all still a little bit sour about that, but the experience in, the, in this locker room is, uh, is second to none. And I think that's going to play a huge role. You know, there's a lot of big, uh, big teams this year. We're going to be playing Michigan early on. And I know that's going to be a good test. There's such a high powered offense, but you know, we play such a game in such a defense first mindset, blue collar game that, you know, we play teams with high powered skill and it's, we're never, we're never, you know, buried. We're never, we're always in hockey games and we always win tight hockey games. So that experience leads the way for that. And I think we're going to have a really, really good chance, really strong chance at something special again this year, man, which is fun to be a part of for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So going into last season a little bit here, you already touched on, you guys came close in that overtime game, but fell a bit short. It's so like, what was that? What was the season like last year with like the COVID season going on, like all the different restrictions that you guys probably had and just no fans, like overall, like what was the experience like? Yeah, it was, uh, it was different. I think it was different for everybody. So I won't act like ours was so crazy, but we play in the, um, in the NCHC and our conference decided that it was best to go into a bubble early on. So we had somewhat of an experience kind of like the, uh, the NHL guys did there where, we went to, you know, the spot was chosen. So Nebraska Omaha was willing to uh, hold everybody and host it. So we ended up packing up all our stuff, got to a hotel, you know, the testing every single day, the couldn't leave the hotel to get meals. You had to have them, you know, Uber Eats or food dudes in whatever you wanted to do. And, you know, you lived in that hotel for three and a half, four weeks. So it was, it was quite the experience and every, you know, every day you were on the ice. So you, you leave while you're doing school in that hotel room too with, you know, crummy connection and, and everyone's trying to figure it out and you're living with a roommate and, you know, it's a tight little hotel room and you're eating meals out of boxes every single meal. It was, uh, it was, it was crazy. Actually, it was, uh, it was quite the experience. And so we had to, we ended up walking to the rink only because it was a short, it was a short walk, you know, 15 minutes or so. So we'd walk to the rink we'd either practice or play a game and then we'd have to walk back we couldn't even shower at the rink because it was you know a breach of the guidelines so you yeah. had you know 25 of us smelling terrible sweating and you know our golf poles and whatnot we were wearing and having to come back and shower at the whole tower room just to wake up the next day and I think we played it was something crazy 15 games in 30 days or something like that wow. or 16 so we were playing games you know, it felt like every other day and, you know, and, and against great competition, like our conference, you know, I, I love seeing other people talk about, you know, playing in the best conference in college hockey, but, you know, between you and I and, and anybody who may listen to this, I don't think it's much of a comparison when we have, uh, you know, uh, us in there and we have the North Dakotas and we have, you know, even Nebraska is, is an unbelievable hockey team. And it's just, you know, we could go through every team and say that they could, they could do really, really well in other conferences. But so it was, that was the start to the year. And so after that, we came back home and had a little bit of a Christmas break, a little mental break, and then finished the rest of the season a little bit more normal in comparison to a regular year. And we're playing on the weekends. We only played in conference, but 
still. And then we ended up having a little bit of a playoff and going back to uh, back to Pittsburgh and back to the frozen four. And, you know, to get into that game, I should actually probably mention that uh, that five overtime game, you know, if you heard over saw that one where North Dakota and us went, uh, went into a war, uh, five overtime war. And that was, uh, that was an experience too. But after winning that game, we had, uh, we had pretty high hopes punching our ticket to Pittsburgh. And then obviously, like I talked about losing to uh, losing a mass, but it was a crazy year, crazy year overall. We just hope that this one's a little more, uh, a little more regular. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, but like, what was that five overtime game? Like, like you must've been tired on just, you guys all must have been feeling it after that game. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what I, I tell it, I tell it, it's, it's funny. You know, what does a coach tell you after, you know, three overtimes, four overtimes, like what's he saying? You know, and we have such a great coach, Scott Sandlin. He's, he's the best coach. A lot of us guys have ever had. It's no comparison. He's soon to be, you know, one of the winningest coaches in, in the conference at all time. It's, he's unbelievable, but you know, we were in that game in North Dakota is unbelievable. They always are. But North Dakota is if you can if you can weather their storm for the first, you know, five, ten, if you can, you know, tire them out a little bit, if you can get on, maybe annoy them a little bit like that boot collar style we play. We always match up well with North Dakota and they, we have great games with them. They beat us. We beat them. And they're an unbelievable program as well. But that was this was one of those games that early on the first five minutes. I don't know if anybody in that place thought we had a thought we had a fighting chance then we kind of you know weathered it a little bit and and kept going and I think that goes out to you know the guys on our team too and just how tenacious and the work ethic and they just keep grinding these guys down and and we did and we ended up you know we were up I think it was you know three one or two nothing whatever it was and North Dakota ended up scoring two goals in the last like two minutes which is they're, they have the ability to do that. They have the scoring guys to do that, the scoring touch. And, and so they ended up scoring and that was leading in the first overtime with a little bit of a sour taste. And, you know, San, Scott Sandlin, you know, our head coach, he just kind of said, let's play our game, get back to it. Don't worry. And after the first overtime finish, guys were tired, but guys were a little pissed off still. After the second overtime, guys are like, oh my gosh, what is this going to end? Like we're getting tired. And then after the third overtime, it seemed like, guys were so tired they were almost laughing and everybody was like you know backs on the ground legs up like like trying to get the lactic acid running trying to feel good not have cement legs and you know we're out there like we can't even take two strides without our legs feeling like concrete man and so you know I remember our head coach coming in after third overtime and being like guys just about digging deep here cliche and then he goes it's it's about it's about balls you know, who's got more. And so we were kind of, you know, that's who we are. And it wasn't, you know, this play, that play, here's what we're going to do. It was just, you got to dig. And after the fourth overtime, uh, the story I like to tell is Brad Berry, the head coach of North Dakota and, and our head coach uh, at, uh, at UMB, they played together at North Dakota in their playing time. So they're friends. And we always see them chatting with each other in hotel lobbies or whatever. Like they still have a great relationship, I'm sure. And competitive as hell. Don't get me wrong. They want to beat, beat each other up as much as they can. And I guess it was the NCAA rule is on the overtimes is if both coaches agree upon um, the ending of a game, whether it's because players may be getting injured or it's just let's restart this game, then they'll, they'll stop the hockey game. And I guess it came down to like the fourth overtime and they had a meeting and I think one of the parties said, maybe we should end this game. And one of the other parties said, I think we have one more overtime in us. And it was that next overtime, two, two or three minutes in when we scored to win. So kind of a cool story there. But uh, and that was, you know, we looked at our phones after the game, you know, like where, where have we been the last six hours? And it was like one, two o'clock. And guys are like, this is, this is ridiculous. People's families falling asleep. But, you know, it was, uh, and that was a morale builder too. For, for the young guys, for the old guys, that was something that was so special to be a part of and such a great group. Yeah, for sure. That, that's a, that, those are funny stories. And just I was I was watching that game till the yeah. end and it was it was like one thirty, and then like a little like trickler, I think five will went in and something like that yeah. to end it. But that that's what you expect in a, oh, 100%. In a five overtime game. Some some cheap goal is going to go in and yeah. that's going to be the winner. A hundred percent. I I was tired of watching that game. I can't yeah, imagine seriously. how all of you guys were. 
Seriously, seriously. Yeah. So then, uh, so like, what did you have to learn throughout like all those games that you played throughout that season, especially with all the all the challenges and the changes that you have to face, especially with COVID around, like where a game could get canceled or pushed back within any time. Yeah, I think the biggest thing from last season in comparison to others was just being prepared and being ready at all times. I mean, we had, like I told you, when we were in that bubble, we had games almost every second day. And so it was every player, every guy had to be at the peak and be ready to go no matter what was happening. And that carried through the season too, because games were canceled. Okay, well, we better get on the ice and act like we just had a hockey game so we don't get, you know, more fatigued. And so when we face a team, we're not more fatigued than they are. And, and, you know, that that was actually a good time to build, you know, such great habits. Um, And again, it sounds so cliche, but that preparedness can go such a long way. at any time to be ready and be willing to be prepared and be willing to be, you know, 100% set with, with your habits, with practice habits. And, you know, every time we get off the ice, it's, it's a rule on our team that you have to do one thing before you get off the ice that you're happy with. So if you end, you know, if we end a scrimmage or we end on a scrimmage on an overtime goal and I was like, I hated how that went in, I'd go and take a few more pucks and do a drill where I feel confident and I feel better because in our on our team it's absolutely unacceptable to lose two games in a row and it's absolutely unacceptable to have two bad days of practice in a row Um, because we're human and even you know the coaches and everybody understand you can have a bad day it it's hockey it's it's every any sport any athlete doesn't matter who you are you have bad days but you don't need to have two in a row especially you don't need to have three in a row so you have to make that happen and that's one thing during last year that was emphasized so much was just make sure every time you have a chance to be on that ice. And, and now I look back at the last four years and just you blink. And, you know, as I can imagine, you feel too, just in the whole college atmosphere as well. But once this season gets going, it just feels like, you know, Monday you're, you're just done resting from the weekend. Tuesday you're full ramped up in practice. Wednesday you practice, you usually leave Thursday, play Friday, play Saturday and restart it. And it just starts to fly by. So every time you're on the ice, it's so easy to just sometimes, you know, not give that extra little bit, but every time you're 1% better every day, 365% better in a year. Right. So what's that one little small thing, if that's it for that day that you can do, you know what I mean? Like, so that was, that was one thing that came out of this COVID year that I think helped, uh, helped a lot of our guys moving forward for sure. Yeah, exactly. You just got to take those times that you can get on the ice and like those memories that you make one step at a time because college goes by quick. And Absolutely, like, man. Like you said, blink of the eye, you're you're already in your fifth year. I'm in my fourth year. So yeah. it's like, it's crazy from freshman to senior, or super senior year. Yeah. And those, and like you said, you know, when we talk even away from the hockey side, just the human side, like that one piece of advice for anybody in college or anything, when people like, I remember getting into junior hockey and, you know, right out of high school, whatever. And I, like you said, I was up in, uh, you know, I was in a different province that drove 30 hours across the country to go play. And, and I remember my seniors doing, saying that to me, you know, it's going to, or, you know, the, whatever you call them in, uh, in, in juniors, not freshmen to seniors, but rookie, the vets, the vets. Um, and that's what I always say how fast it went. And I never believed them, but this, this has been crazy. And all these memories, like, whether you go and play pro hockey, you step out into the real world and, and start working every day and realize it's not just an internship or a summer summer career. It's 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 your career career for the rest of your life. And so you look back on these memories with these people and just try and take it in as much as you can and be mindful and be lucky that you have the opportunity to be there. Like this has been to be a part of something like like this organization has been incredible. So just take everything in, whether you're in college whether you're not going to college, just young in your life, take it all in, man. Try and take it all in. Yeah, exactly. I love that. So, like, going into, like, the bubble here a little bit, like, what was, like, balancing, like, school, like, in the bubble? Because, like, you were you said you were doing classes in the bubble. So, like, what was that all like in the struggle that probably ha- occurred because of, like, the, the poor connection, like you said, and, like, you're just in a hotel room doing your work? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it, it, it was, it was interesting for sure. Wasn't my favorite, um, but it's tough too, because you have a, you have a roommate and, you know, you know, in a regular hotel room, there's two, you know, the queen size, right. The queen size beds right beside each other. You guys are living like with each other. It's almost like a dorm style almost where you're like, you're living with that person. And so for myself in college, I've, I, I never even lived in a dorm. I, I've always been in a house and always had space to be doing my own thing. So I think it was difficult because I had, you know, a roommate who was, uh, who was doing another degree. And so we had different class times and different schedules. And so there'd be, you know, movies going on in the background or he'd be doing something else and then vice versa. When he was doing homework, I'd be wanting to have my relaxed time. So, so that made it a little bit difficult as well. And just different years too, even though I love my roommates, one of my brothers, but he, uh, we had such a fun time as well, but on the school side of things, it made things kind of hard at times just to balance each other's schedule. There was only one desk. So who gets the desk? And then, so those are small things, but it was, I think it was big on the university uh, to work with us as much as they did only because our schedule was, was so crazy that we missed a lot. And so it was a lot of playing catch up. Uh, but that put a lot of pressure on us as student athletes too, right? To be to be assuring that our teachers knew what was going on. The professors never were questioning if our if we weren't putting in that effort, if they gave us an opportunity to make up something. And so I think it was great when everybody decided that we were going to go into this bubble. That you know the director of academics as well as athletic to the school made sure that on the academic side they were understanding, but he made it clear to us that if we weren't going to put in that effort and show that we care to those professors, the professors had every right to, uh, to give us a hard time. But I think away from that, the only thing was the, uh, was the Wi-Fi issue. So I think there was a whole uh, getting kicked out of classes during presentations and freezing forever. But I think that's something everybody's faced to an extent in, uh, in COVID and the zoom university stuff. So pretty crazy though. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, exactly. Zoom Zoom University 2021 was uh was interesting. That's that's for sure. That's for sure, my man. That is absolutely for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. So then going into into your third year a little bit, it was cut short due to COVID nineteen. Of course, like what was what was that season like for you and the team before you guys got cut short? Yeah, I mean that that was tough. That was the uh, that was the year we were defending our two national championships back to back which would have been, you know, the third time if we, when we would have gone three in a row, um, that would have been the first time since Michigan, like early, early, like sixties or something like that. So to be able to have the opportunity to do that. And we had, um, you know, Shep was there at the time, Hunter Shepard, who's an incredible goaltender, but arguably the most decorated college goalie of all time, um, who, who should, and I hope we'll have a great career in the NHL. He was unbelievable. And he was playing his, he was playing his game at the time. He was hot. Our team was unbelievable. We were confident. We were good. So going into that, I think it was, you know, it's funny how everybody heard about this whole virus and it was, you know, did you hear what's going on over in China? And all the guys like, oh yeah, they're, you know, they're doing uh, whatever. And, you know, you didn't think much of it. And then, you know, it all, it all started to become a little more real. And I think that was for everybody to an extent where it was like, oh no, this is, this is something but we always, for whatever reason, whether we were just not being honest with ourselves or, or I don't know what it was, we never thought it would cancel the season. So we went all the way up. And I remember Miami um, of Ohio was here to play us in the first play, uh, like in the first playoff. And so they had just arrived and we had been hearing all this stuff. But again, for whatever reason, <laughs> it was just it wasn't going to affect us. And we heard about other programs, you know, canceling their playoffs, whatnot. And so. Miami got there and we were just about to go out and skate for the night before um, skate before the game the next day. And, you know, we had a team meeting. We were all sitting there again, not thinking. And, and so, we, you know, our coach came in and let us know that it was, you know, this series was going to be canceled for now, but like, don't worry. Like we don't think the NCAA tournament will be canceled. We're just going to have to cancel this take a week, we'll practice, and then we'll head off to, you know, the NCAA tournament in our regional, which we were, we were already in. We were either number one or number two seed. 
And so we went home, like, well, what do we do? And I think it was like, maybe we grab a pack, a pack of beer or something and sit around and have some laughs. And, you know, it's funny because we knew some of the Miami guys. And usually like when we go out there, they come here like any people in college. Usually if you have a good rapport with other guys on the team, like either from juniors or whatever it is, you know, they'll they'll come and see you guys after the game or whatever. You're, you're still humans, right? After the game, you know, yeah. just beat, beat each other up. It's war um, during the so game, but after some of Miami guys, exactly, exactly. Um, it's almost worse during the game if you know the guys. It's almost more intense. Um, and so we were talking Miami guys, and then we got we got a call. I think it was two hours later, like the uh, the season season's done, and it was like in the matter of you know five hours, we went from playing our first playoff game to the whole entire season being done, and we were like, what's going on? And so he said, well, I guess, you know, it's vendor week. <laughs> like, I guess we, uh, I guess we got to do what you got to do and, and, and at least celebrate each other in the season, even though everyone's, you know, sad and the seniors got cut short, but let's at least do that together. And so we all got together that night and then, you know, the next, next day as well. And then everything started to become so real that, you know, I'm a Canadian. So us Canadians, we started to be told like, listen, it may be a better idea for you to, uh, for you to get out of here and head home because this may, this may get even worse than it is now. And so I talked to my old man on the phone about what the best decision would be. And he is kind of like, you know what, I think you should pack your bags right now and, and get on over the border. And so the next day, I think, you know, guys that were from wherever they went ended up going home and, and that the rest was kind of history. And then we ended up coming back after that, but crazy the way it ended that year was we were strong. I thought we were going to make another really good run. Like we usually will. Um, so it's too bad, but you know, you control, you can control, which is one of the biggest things that I've ever learned from hockey. So. Yeah. It's all about controlling what you can control. That was obviously out of your control. So you can't really do anything about it, but Absolutely. like you could control like that. You're still making memories with the boys and just yeah. making, making the most out of a, a pretty shitty time, but you gotta, you gotta make the most of it. Like that's what I've learned. You gotta, like so a lot of people were down on themselves during during the whole COVID and all that, Absolutely. but like you got to find ways to make it better and like start start new uh new traditions, I guess you could say, and just Absolutely. do whatever you can to make you happy. Absolutely, man, it's the biggest thing. Yeah, exactly. So then I want to go into your first and second year since you won the net. You guys won the national the Natty Champs, right? Yeah. That, those years, so like, what were those two years like in winning? the national championship and going back to back in those two years. Yeah, I think the first thing I'll say that comes to mind right now is you really learn what it takes to be a team. Um, and what I would say is that it took every single guy on our team to buy in, took every single guy on our team to play their game and play their role. The first half of that season, uh, my freshman year, we were under 500 by Christmas. After Christmas, uh, our the goalie at the time, Shep, uh, Hunter Shepard, ended up setting UMD records and tying NCAA records after being under 500 the first half of the season. So you can only imagine how great he and the rest of us played that second half of that season. And we ended up it's actually on our, uh, on our national championships rings on the inside. We have it engraved. It's 0 .001, um, which was the percentage we had to make it into the NCAA tournament. So I remember coming back um, from the NCHC, we had just lost to North Dakota and our chances we knew were so slim. And so I remember being on the bus and seeing like guys with phones out everywhere, like, like watching these games and I was like, okay, so what has to happen? Like, I went up to one of the older guys. I was like, what has to happen for us to make this tournament? He's like, listen, they got to lose. They got to win. They got to lose. They got to lose. They got to win. And they got to win. And I was like, okay, so what is that percentage? And he's like, well, one analyst, I think, just came out and said it's 0 .001. So I was like, all right, well, sorry, fellas. It's, 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 it's too little too late. Um, and then as this drive started unfolding, things started falling into place. So guys are like, you'd hear one section of the bus scream. And I was like, did they win? They won. Okay, great. And then you look over, they lost? Boys, there's like three out of six right now that are going. And so it started to build, it started to build. And we ended up getting to five out of those six games 
had gone our way. And so we arrived back at our arena and there was one game that was in, that was going into overtime. I believe it was Ohio state and Notre Dame in big 10. And so we raced into our locker room, turned the game on the TV. We're all kind of standing there, like, you know, nervous as all as anything. And I remember them scoring and us all just erupting knowing we just bought our punched our ticket to go like like equipment was flying everywhere we didn't even have equipment on it was just guys or so we were still in our suits and bags weren't unpacked yet but people were throwing things it was it was crazy because we punched a ticket and I remember right after that happened it was like 11 at night or something like that and our coach didn't let us go home and he sat us down and he was like listen Everything up until this point, he's like from all of my coaching days, and he he had won a national championship with UMB in 2011 was his first. So he said, everything is done now. All that matters is if you win four hockey games, you're a national champion. And so when you put it into the perspective, like, can you can you play four good games in a row? And he's like, we're gonna take it one game at a time. So our first games against you know whatever, and he was Air Force and you know, first game, second game, third. And we ended up, you know, every game was by a goal, single goal. And it was unbelievable. Goaltending was unbelievable leadership, but it was literally such a team that ended up coming together after those four days and playing their role that it, uh, it, it made for the coolest, you know, freshman year I could have ever asked for. Like, um, and then that led into our second, you know, that led into my second year. And that year was crazy up having my second shoulder surgery so I lost my whole season actually um but I was you know I was around I ended up by the end of the year practicing again so I was able to be a part of the you know the frozen four and be there and see it all again and you know it was the same deal this time around we had a little more experience and ended up being a little bit higher ranked and had a comfortable seed going into the NCAAs and you know but to do it again was it was those four games again and they were close and then that game against UMass, the final in 20, uh, 2018-19, yeah, that was when Kale McCarr was there, but I, I didn't even know he was on the ice at the time. It was, you know, if you ever want to watch a college hockey game, that's, I'd say, as close to perfect as you can see a team play a system. It was unbelievable. I think they had 17, 16 shots at the time, and they were all from the outside. There was really no grade-A scoring chances, and it was just, an absolute showing. It was unbelievable. And I always, you know, we always watch clips from that game when we're going over things, even, you know, to this day, and I'm sure we'll watch more of them this year, but though that that's a game I tell people to watch. Like if you want to see a complete hockey game being played, it was, you know, not the most exciting because we aren't the most exciting team to watch, but systems wise, it was playing something to a T and everyone buying in, which is, uh, which was unbelievable to be a part of, man. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah, that that's unreal. And just like just like that, like a team that gels together and comes close yeah. and fights for fights for one another, like goes to war with each other. Like those are the teams that you remember forever. And those are the teams that end up winning the yeah. championship because they're so close and they all buy in from the yeah. best player on the team to like top that's to bottom. It, like that's you're it. all it's you're it. all going in for it. So like that's all that that matters at that point. And you know, seeing some you know, holding each other accountable is huge. I've learned in these four or five years, you know, whether it's your best friend, whether you're the best player, whether you're, you know, a guy that plays a fourth line role and chips pucks in, does the right thing. You'll hold each other accountable because that'll in turn, one, make the team better and one, make that player better as well. Two, the best players on the ice can also be uncharacteristic on the ice. And what I mean by that, we had guys like, Scott Prunovich, Hobie Baker winner, who, who were blocking shots, who were eating pucks, putting their body on the line to see a team win. When other guys see that, it's like, well, he's doing that. He was unbelievable. And he was doing that. So why are we not all doing that? And then we all start doing that. And it just, it just, it, it's a, it's a snowball effect. It's a domino effect and things start falling into place, but you're absolutely right, man. 100%. Yeah, and it's, it's – those are the best moments, too, because you're all – the chemistry is unbelievable, unbelievably high in those situations, and that's what you play for. It's just you play for the boys, you play for play for the team, play for one another, and you go to, you go to battle. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. 
so throughout your college career so far, like your second year, you're you're nabbed as like the third string goalie. So like, how what, was it difficult to be a, the third string goalie? Or like, it seems like you've took a lot out of everything throughout all these all these experiences that you've had. Even though you're the third string, so like, how do you go about being a third string and just working to get better every day, even if you're not playing as many games as you would want? Yeah. That's a great question. And, and I enjoy this question only because of course it's hard. I mean, there's, there was times and, you know, even, even last year was difficult because, you know, I'd finally had it, that chance where it was, you know, I had such a good nine months leading up to this bubble. And, you know, I think even, you know, fellow players on the team and some leaders and some other guys had thought maybe I was the one that, you know, was in that spot to take that first game. And, and, uh, and when you aren't called upon, it hurts. And, you know, there's, but what I will say is I've been able to be a part of such an unbelievable program, but moreover, I've played with some real good goalies now. And, uh, and, you know, when, when Shep was here, it was like, you could have been Marty Broder and you weren't playing over Hunter Shepard at this, at that time. And he was setting records and, so in the back of your head, it's like, well, what if, what if, you know, you're my first year I finished, you know, second year we brought a freshman and it was me and, and, you know, I was the one going on trip. So then I was the second goal, you know, in that third year too, you know, you're the second goal. What happens if Shep can't play? Well, he ended up being an iron man and playing every single game that season, which is unheard of, but you know, unlike the NHL, like we only play Friday, Saturday. So if the goal is healthy, you can usually play in both games. You don't necessarily need to rest them. But what if, right? And so if the, if the team's waiting on you and seeing on you that like, listen, he's not stepping up to the plate. He's getting complacent. It's not helping anybody. And I think it's so mental goaltending. And I'm probably reiterating what a bunch of other goalies have said, but I think strong goaltenders, one thing I've at least learned from them, we had, you know, Hunter Miska is always around in the program. Kazmir Kaskasuo is always around and, you know, Shep's around all the time too. And we always have great chats about, you know, the mental side of, because then they go up to pros and they aren't the guy, you know, and then they're in a position where I just played four years. I was the starting goal. We said two years I, and now I'm backing up or now I'm in the ECHL or now I'm fighting again. And it's like, if you're ever complacent, if you're ever, content if you're ever comfortable that's where somebody else is going to step up and someone else is going to take that you know take that spot and you're always in a fight right you're always in a fight but there's so much to learn in life and hockey is unbelievable and hockey's taught all of us hockey players more than we can even imagine whether it's a disciplined team or work ethic all of these things doing the right thing right integrity that's going to translate to life that, you know, I look at this opportunity and where I've been and what I've seen, people I've met, the, the, the learning that I've had over the last four or five years. And, you know, it's a difficult place to play pro hockey. It's a difficult place to play in the NHL. And if there's anything that you can understand, it's that even if you do play a 10, 15 year career in the NHL, there's life after that too. And so many of these lessons of, are you going to be the one that, you know, gives up when things get hard and adversity it looks you in the face. Guess what? Whether you're playing hockey or whether you're in a role in your career, it's going to be the same deal. It's going to be the same last, it's going to be the same opportunity if something gets hard in the office and it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, it's okay. It's all good. Whatever. I'll be like, like you want to be that person on and off the ice. And you have to remember to it in scenarios like for me, like the community has been so big for me too, because giving back to someone who's, who's given me what I have and, you know, scholarship stuff as well. Like they do pay us to be here just in a different way and, and in school. So giving back and becoming that person because you're representing the program more than you're ever representing yourself. And these are all things that, you know, whether you're playing or not, and, you know, our coaches are great about it too, because we, we care about character and we scout character more than we scout the top players in the country and who scores the more schools. Like they look into, you know, I remember when I was being, you know, scouted and they were looking at me, you know, they call 
your coaches. They call your billets. They call your goalie coaches. And it's not like, how is he as a goalie? Listen, I was in junior hockey. You know, I, I, you, you, it's always the top goalie in top leagues. You know what I mean? We're all, yeah. we're all the top goalie in whatever league. Yeah. You, you know, you hold records for save percentages or goals against average, or, you know, you're up for goalies of the year, whatever your team, but we're all those guys. But then it becomes, you know, you got to be a good goaltender to make it to that NCAA level. There's no doubt about that. But then it becomes, who is this guy as a person? And so they really look into that. And that'd be one piece of advice I'd give anybody that wants to play at this next level. And that's in a hardship, even in juniors or whatever it is. One, you'd be ready no matter what happens. You'd be mentally strong. You don't show it. Never, ever show it because you're going to ruin the rest for your team. Don't be selfish. Be a teammate. Because then it'll also give the coaches the want to give you that opportunity too. Um, but also be, be, be a person as much as you are a hockey player. And it's free to be nice, right? You always yeah. want to help people around you and be the person that – be a good teammate, be a leader, want to help other people because you can all succeed together. Just because someone else is succeeding doesn't mean you can't. We can all succeed together, whether it's not in the exact way you thought. It may be in a different way, but – Everybody can see, succeed together, and, and it's free to be nice. So make sure you're a good teammate as well as a good hockey player. That's what I've learned from it all. Yeah, exactly. And just like you, like hockey's taught me so much about like team teamwork, like not giving up. Like when you face adversity, face it head on. Like yep. don't don't give in to it. Just keep fighting, keep battling your way out. And just like I like how you said character as well, because I, I I went to a pro camp earlier in August, and there yeah. the coach like you uh you guys better have good good character like i don't want any any of any of like the bad characters on my team just you got you guys got to be nice to the community take care of your community and start and that's what it all comes down to like being a good person and just having having good character absolutely man absolutely yeah so like throughout your four years of college hockey so far going in your fifth year like what have been some of your favorite memories this like outside of outside of those national championships like is there other games that stick out to you because obviously national championships those are going to be your favorite moments like do you have any other favorite moments that you'd like to share yeah sure I, I can I can share one or two I have I have too many to uh too many lists I feel like there's one day I want to I want to write a story just for myself just so I can I can go back and, and look at them all just it's difficult too because it all falls into this mixing pot and I'm sure even when you know we relate it to college I mean when you say you know your favorite times of college you get this whole replay in your head of like yeah this party was crazy or this one but you know for for me I remember you know there was a few times but the the national this was when I realized I was in I was playing college hockey and I was here and it was our opening weekend was against the the Gophers so the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers and obviously it's our biggest rival when we play them it gets crazy and, you know, we, we did our starting lineups and the place was stuffed. It was like, we had six or 7,000, probably set closer to seven, probably like 6,700, 7,000 with standing room, like stuffed of fans. And I remember the student section was going bananas. And so the star spangled banner started playing instead of at the end, a tradition for us is instead of home of the brave, it's home of the bulldogs and everybody in the crowd raised their hand. And I remember, I didn't know that it was the first time, but everyone in the crowd knew. And we were standing on the lineup and I was beside, you know, he was another goalie that came through here. He was, he was kind of a second and third string guy. And, and I remember looking at one of the smartest guys I've ever met, still one of my best friends. And I remember looking at him and, and, and just realizing like, wow, this crowd is amazing. And he's like, I remember him being like, just wait. And it was like home of the, and the, all the 7,000 said bulldogs. And I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I just remember this feeling of like looking at him and looking around and my family was there and all the young guys' families were there. Every family was there, every alumni you could imagine, NHL guys, all this stuff. And it, it erupted. And then once it was done, we started skating again. I remember being so nervous that I felt like I couldn't even start skating around and continuing that little warm up, but that was one of my favorite memories. I mean, the same thing happened that year at the XL Energy Center when we were playing in the final, but it was like 20,000 in the national championship. And because it was in Minnesota, it was all Minnesota fans when we were playing Notre Dame in the national championship. And I remember, again, looking at that goalie because we'd always stand beside each other. And this time when they said home of the Bulldogs, I was like, okay, 
this is what a packed NHL barn feels like. This is madness. You couldn't hear anything. We couldn't hear our coach, couldn't hear anything. So, you know, th those were two. That was definitely the summed up that first freshman year. And then from there, it just seemed like, you know, I wish I could remember being on the ice, winning that, that first national championship, but I feel they're just, you know, I blacked out. I was just, it was so exciting and something, you know, you only dream of in college hockey. And so, you know, holding that trophy and having that happen was, it was just unbelievable, man. So there's, there's a lot of memories, but that was definitely one that stood out hearing that whole crowd, you know, chant that bulldog. Yeah, that, that's unreal. Those make for some great memories. And just when you realize you're in college, like that's, that's where it's at right there. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few stories that I, you and I could sit around a fire and we could tell with a, with a few beers in our hand one day, Jack, which I'm sure we will, oh, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, that, one's, that, one's a good, that one's a good one for now. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to get into your junior hockey days a little bit here before we uh, wrap things up a little bit. Yeah, so sure uh, you go into, you go into your juniors after your youth hockey career. So like, what was, what was youth hockey like for you growing up in Brampton, Ontario, and then just going in, going throughout through juniors in the SJHL with the Notre Dame Hounds and then going to the MJHL with the Woodstock Slammers and then back to Notre Dame. Yeah, no, I definitely had a, a bit of a, you know, unconventional um, road to getting there, but it's funny because you look around a locker room right now and I can give you 20 stories that even, even top mine of how guys got to where we are. You know, there's the, there's the few that are, you know, they were born in Duluth and they grew up as a UMB fan and they ended up just going to high school and committing straight from there and playing one year junior and coming out. But those are the minority. Majority of guys are like, yeah, I went over to Texas and came up and over and you're like, this is crazy. But, you know, I came out of, I came out of Brampton, Ontario, played youth hockey there, um, ended up leaving home at 15. Uh, I went to play at a prep school in Ottawa called CIH Academy. Uh, I then left CIH and I, I was in a boarding school there. Um, I then left CIH to go play in Toronto for a school called Peak. Um, it's now called Blythe, but some notable alumni there were like the Connor McDavid. Uh, some of the Sioux bands were there, you know, it Josh Hosang. So it was, it was quite the, uh, it was an athletic school out in Toronto. And so I lived in an apartment um, just outside of North York um, and played hockey there for my grade 12 year. And then my coach there ended up knowing a coach or knew a coach out in Saskatchewan. And, you know, I'd never, I didn't really know much about Saskatchewan. I don't know if a lot of people do, but uh, you know, at the time, I guess it was, uh, it was pretty heavy pay to play in the Ontario junior hockey leagues. And so when they were talking about the SJHL and, you know, there's some, some committed commits coming out of there, you know, goalie wise, especially at the time. And I was like, you know, I, I don't mind going somewhere else. I haven't lived at home already for, you know, for two years. So I wouldn't mind the experience. And he's like, we'd, we'd love to have you out. We'll, we'll get you out for a camp and, and see what happens. But we've already watched tapes. Like we'd love to have you even, you know, battle for a spot this year. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That'd be awesome. So ended up doing that, ended up getting in my car and, and driving, you know, that 30 hours from Toronto to Saskatchewan and moved into a, uh, moved into a dorm. Actually, we all live the dorm the junior team did um, away from everyone else so that was pretty crazy uh, ended up playing there had a really good had a really good um, it was around like 15 games or something I ended up playing because we had a starting goalie at the time who ended up committing to University of Maine um, but that was a great year great learning experience played real well played really good hockey uh, felt really confident ended up coming back to Notre Dame for this my second year thinking I was starting and the other goal, we ended up decommitting from University of Maine for uh, for some other reasons. And so he ended up just being right back there. And so I kind of met with the coach and he was like, listen, I can't do with, uh, you know, with the other goalie at the time. He's like, the best I can do right now is split you guys time. He's like, but I know of a few coaches that are interested if, if you were open to doing the trade route. And I was like, well, didn't expect that, but let's do it. Where, what do you got? And he's like, well, there's a team that's hosting what's called the Fred Page Cup. And that's one step before uh, the RBC Cup, which is all of Canada's junior eight basically challenge. And so to, to be on a team that is hosting that tournament, you have a great chance of going all the way. And there's tons of scouts, tons of opportunity to make that next level. And I was like, wow, that'd be great. And they're like, and they need to start and go. And they really like what they've seen. I was like, it sounds fantastic. Where am I going? Like, what am I going up a few two hours or what? And he's like, Well, it's in, it's in a different league. And I was like, Okay, where? Am I? 
where am I going, coach? Tell me what's going on. He's like, well, I talked to him yesterday. You know, it's out in, uh, it's out in New Brunswick. I was like, New Brunswick, eh? I was like, well, okay. I, I, I didn't, I don't know about this. Like maybe we can talk to some other coaches, whatever. And I ended up getting a call from the goalie coach out there and, he was like, you know, the grandpa we all want. And he's, you know, the old style French guy, so nice. And he kind of talked me into it a little bit too. I talked to my family and they said, you know what, let's like do it, let's do it. It's such an experience, try it. I've heard people are unbelievable out there. So I said, okay. And I ended up, you know, packing my car there, driving cross country. That one was 42 hours, I think. Wow. So 42 hours, a few podcasts, a few calls later, and uh, I was listening to uh, listening to your podcast. No, I'm just but uh, went over there, and that was the best decision I've ever made in my life, and I didn't know it at the time. That program, um, do you know? Do you know what McCain fries are? Like the 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 company McCain, they make like frozen mm. foods. But so John McCain was our owner of our team. So, so big, big dough, real, real big dough. And he, he took care of his players so well. Um, I couldn't take, you know, anything of, of, of whatnot because I didn't want to lose my eligibility NCAA wise, but yeah. you know, some of the guys had been playing in the QMJHL and the OHL and they were, were basically bought from those teams and brought over to stack our team. And, you know, they treat us so well, that community, was unbelievable you know the tim tim horton's coffee cards had our logo on it i felt like a celebrity in this little town because there was five thousand people so like all they had was the hockey game and nothing was even close so it was like oh you're you know you're ben Pat. it was like it was it was crazy it was unbelievable it was such a great experience and i played really well that year i ended up you know i was up for glory of the year um i won save percentage had top goals against average i was you that was probably my best you know, performance wise of hockey. Um, and there was some good, there was some good players out there. It's just, it's not looked at a lot only because there's a lot that filtered down from major junior. So there's not a lot of college out of there because there was only three guys that were even eligible on my team. And I was one of them. The rest had already played some semi pro, but so I ended up talking to some schools from there, but it was nothing really set in stone. Uh, a lot out East, nothing really in the NCHC just because it was a little more away from there but basically the next year um we ended up having a a ton of guys leave the owner what didn't want wanted to sell the team and things kind of started falling apart a little bit and so I had a really good relationship with the head coach and I went in there and he was like listen I don't want you to end your career here we aren't going to have a good team we aren't going to win a lot of hockey games he's like I want to give you a place and a position where you're going to be in front of some some good scouts and you know we talk some teams, whatever, but you can have free range. I've already told the owners that like, we're going to, we're going to trade you. Um, and we don't want to see you. And so he did me a real big favor there. And I was like, I would have loved to stay there, but in reality, I, I had, to, I had to go. And so these are the decisions, like they're, they're tough decisions, but I ended up making calls everywhere, you know, chances in the BCHL, um, chances in the SJ for other teams in the AJHL. Um, and then also in, in Ontario and, I ended up, you know, talking to some people for a while. And then I ended up talking to my old coach at Notre Dame. And he was like, listen, we had another goalie that's committing at Christmas to go D1. He's like, I'll give you the starting role right away. He's like, even if it takes you a few games to get back into it, I don't care. He's like, I'd love for you to come back for this last like second half of the season. He's like, I already know some coaches I've talked to you about for the next level. Like if you're willing to do it, let's do come back. And, you know, versus some other coaches in the BCHL weren't really ready to just say, they're like, yeah, we want to be able to, you know, make you the starter, but you got to earn your time. You got to come here. Yeah. And so having somebody that I felt was going to give me that chance, no matter what I was comfortable with, because you got to play games, you got to yeah. play games. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to play games, you're burying yourself. So you got to play games. And so I ended up telling, you know, Clint, let's do it. Ended up going back. And in the first, Three, or first five games I think I was pulled twice um got lit up another game and then I ended up going on a tear and and I uh, was I I, sh I played half the season there and I was up for goalie of the year again that that year so you know it was just it was trusting that he was going to give me that shot no matter what and he kept his word and it ended up working out really well where you know, we had talked to a bunch of coaches. There's a few options, but then when Hunter Miska ended up signing in the NHL 
and they had a spot at UMB that was kind of that number one choice by uh, by a mile. So it was a, it was a long process, but the road is full of adversity. There was injuries. I ended up having surgery somewhere in there too, but I don't want to keep you here all day. And uh, but you know it, it's how we all you know it's how we all come from adversity and how we all react and how we all build ourselves from there and whatever that opportunity is. I learned so much being out in different places. I saw the world, at least the Canadian world, which seems like the world because the surface area of Canada is so dang large. But, and I got to meet such amazing people in my time there while playing hockey. And hockey was able to give me all of that. And, and still to this day, I'm thankful for that. So for all the different roads and different paths, I'm sure everybody has a pretty few crazy stories, but, but that was mine, so. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's all about it's all about that opportunity that you're given or you have to earn and you got to take take it and roll with it because yeah. you might you may only get that one opportunity and you got to just prove yourself and prove that you can play at that level. Absolutely right, man. Absolutely right. Yeah, so uh, that was that was awesome. So I have a few more questions for you. So uh, do you have any tips for goaltenders looking to get to that next level? I know we talked a bit about some other tips, but do you have any other advice that you give goaltenders? I think the one thing that I'm seeing in a lot of coaching I'm doing right now and a lot of goalie coaching I'm doing out in the Midwest area is the one thing that a lot of coaches are looking for that, that I feel like scouts are, are also missing right now is a battle to compete. Um, some of these younger kids, they lack a, uh, they lack a compete factor, battle factor. It's so important, the technical side of things, uh, but I think almost any goalie coach or goaltender of any sort would take, you know, a confident goalie that's willing to compete and, and battle no matter what over the best technical, best skater, best this, best skilled goalie. And, you know, it's so important to work on everything. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, and I may be a little old school because I'm older than some of these young goalies now, but at the end of the day, you stop a puck and how you do it sometimes does not matter. So I will say that that compete and that battle that sometimes gets messy is so important. And even in tryouts, like I remember, you know, and I still, I was out one a few weeks ago. It was like the U18, like for the national team development program, they were scouting. It was like this tournament. I remember one of their goalie scouts being like, I just feel like there was no compete out there from those goalies. Like when they were out of position, there was no battle. There was no compete. And it wasn't even that they needed to stop the puck. It was just that they were showing that effort. And so I think combined with how hard and how good young goalies are getting and how technically strong they are, just, just always have that compete, always have that willingness to battle until that, until that final whistle, until that puck, uh, until that puck is not in the net. It's 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 in your gut or it's under your glove for a whistle. Yeah, absolutely. I hundred percent agree, agree with you there. Like I've seen so many goalies, like when a puck comes off the pad right to a guy, like in the slot, like they won't even move. They'll just let oh. it go past them. But like yeah. uh, I compete for every puck. Like I'll do anything I can to stop that puck, whether it be a paddle save, just like turning the blocker upside down, getting a have to getting a puck there. Good man. Hurting hurting my pinky, like my fingers Good. just like anything like I you I want to you you have to keep the puck out of the net like that's that's your job it is absolutely absolutely I remember I remember I briefly met James Reimer a while ago when he was in Toronto and uh and I was just talking to him I was like listen here's who I am at the time junior goalie I'm hoping to play college like what would you say like one piece of advice he's like stop the puck and I was like no seriously he's like no I'm serious like stop the puck he's like at the end of the day He's like, we're all working hard to be the best, best technical goalie we can. Just stop the puck, man. And I was like, I like that. I like that. Because we are goalies. We're all these crazy son of a guns who like to get pucks at us. And we're all quirky and weird in our own ways. But, you know, we're all we're all trying every day at goalie skate to be so perfect technically. But then at the end of the day, it could change a game. So these young, young guys, just the one piece of advice that say, one, you got to battle. Two, always come back from adversity better than you were before it. And, and three, just, just work, man. Just put your head down, work, and be a good teammate. Those would be the three things I'd say for sure. Yeah, exactly. I, I love them. My next question for you like, is uh, how important is it to be a student of the game? Because 
even if you're older, like you could still still oh. learn things every single day. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young, how young you are. You know what? I take back what I just said, just thinking about what you just said, only because my number one by far would be being coachable and being willing to learn by far. That's in life too. In life, in your career, in some of the, so I'm, my undergraduate was in finance. And so in, in general management and in finance, you always hear those Warren Buffetts and those big investors that make all these huge moves. And it's funny because Warren Buffett's worth hundreds of billions of dollars or, and or billions of dollars. And his, his company Berkshire Hathaway also is too, but he is the godfather of investing. But he's the first one to say, I need to learn every day because I know nothing compared to what I could know. The Andre Vasilevsky's, the Marty Broder's, the, the top goalies in their primes will all tell anybody that they didn't know everything. You know, Patrick Wall may have been all know everything. But I'm just saying, you know, because personality wise, but I'm just saying all jokes aside, you need to be willing to learn from everyone, anybody around you. We have some young studs on our team right now. And we had this conversation, a few of us the other day of like, learn from some of the older guys, individual little things. If X shoots better than you, how does he shoot? Ask him, hey, dude, how can I work on my shot? Hey, brother, tell me, help me out. If he can make a first breakout pass better than you, how, what do you focus on when you're making that breakout pass? What do you look like? How are you and learn? Because you're only making yourself better from every coach, everybody be coachable. As coach, you can be a student of the game, no matter what, even if you're at your very best, you can always be better. Always. Yeah. That's such a good question, man. I love that. Always yeah, exactly. Be you always got to be willing to learn. Like you can get, you get better every single day by just learning, like uh, going to, going to games and just learn. I don't say, I don't take, I don't say I lose. I say I learn like, yeah. cause that's, no, that's you, what it is. Like you learn you from the to. losses. It's a really good point. Jack. It is. I, I remember a little quick interview with, I think it was me. It was about McDavid, but it was dry side all. And I guess McDavid had asked him like, Hey, like, when you release a puck, like it, it comes off so nicely. Like, what are you focusing on? Like your, like your top wrist or something like that. And dry side like laughed and told the interviewer, he's like, why is Connor McDavid asking me anything about and made that joke. But it's like, it goes to show that mindset of like, he's the best in the world. There's no, there's no argument at all there, but, and he's still learning because you, you, you literally have to, and that's such a good point. And learning from experiences and losses always, Always, if you just lose and move on, you, you're, you're doing yourself the biggest disservice, man. You watch that tape, you figure it out, you work on it. Only way you'll grow in life too, man. Everyone's going to make yeah. mistakes. We're not perfect. You own it. You own it. You hold yourself accountable and you learn from it. And you don't make the same mistake twice, or at least you try not to. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent agree with you there. So my next question for you is, uh, you're a smaller goalie in the goalie. We're at five eleven, according to your elite prospects. So like, what has made you such a great goaltender being on the shorter side of things and not letting height get to you? Like most yeah. goalies are like six, three, six, four, like they're tall guys. And like, we're, yeah. we're on the shorter end. I'm five ten. you're five eleven. So what? I'm not five eleven. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, so what, what makes you... I'm more yeah, like five, yeah. nine, five, ten. <laughs> so yeah, what makes you such a successful goaltender at, with uh, being five, nine, five, ten, somewhere around there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm yeah no it's it's a good question in such a hard time for for smaller goalies it is it, it was even worse I think a few years ago I think there's you know a few smaller guys that are making a big bit of an impact but I mean in the NHL right now give me a guy that's under six foot anymore I mean Jonas Enroth is he and or he's guy I mean who's the or sorry UC Saros, UC Saros guess, would be, yeah. yeah would be the only one Enroth's been gone for a while so I met Saros but he's unbelievable but I think Two things I'd say would be, or I'll say three things. One would be skating. You need to be a good skater. You got to be quick. You need to be quick because um, you got to get around the crease. It's easier for my goalie partner. He was six six, um, and the other one six four. So go figure. But you know they can move across that crease a lot easier than I can, and so I need to get there, from point A to point B, the same if not quicker than they can get there. And I would even argue faster because we need to maybe gain some more depth, right? 
So if you think about that straight line, they can go back and have a less way to go. I need to go forward a little more. So that's number one. Number two, I would say, is that the depth control that, you know, it was a, it was a buzzword box control, just understanding where you are in your crease. We're going to have to take extra inches here and there. Um, being in college was a big eye opener. How, how tight these players can put it and like your reverse VH stuff, you know, the amount of times where instead of I, I, I'm, I'm here on the post, I'm here on the post and I need to use my face. I need to use other things guys may not worry about. Um, and with that point, piggybacking off that one specifically, always keeping your hands and your shoulders reactive and a good fast reactive save is a, is a calm, relaxed save. So like when goalies are real tight, you, you see them, it's, it's not as reactive and not as quick sometimes as being nice and relaxed up top and making that save. So it's that box control in depth um, as well as the skating and the reaction. And then the third one I'd just say is that extra compete, man. No one's ever, no one ever will all compete. No one will ever help. Well, when I was, I was told that very young and I was ingrained in that. And the goalie coach I grew up with was extremely intense um, we worked with the Marlies for a while, but that's the way I grew up. I used to be scared of them. Now I appreciate them, but he used to always ingrain, like, if you don't compete, you compete, you compete, you compete. And that's, that's something that's helped me along the way. That's why I believe in it so much too. Like you're a smaller guy. You better be the one that's, they're like, wow, this little mm, guy yeah. is mm. not giving up on this puck, man. And he's battling and he's out here. He's every puck's not going it. Like, you know, it's very easy to get into this blocking style. Um, but just make sure to compete, man. So those are three things I'd say for a smaller goalie and, and never, ever, ever use your size as an excuse. Yeah. It's what you're given. Carby been dealt. Can't, I tried to stretch as much as I can hanging from the ceiling, trying to grow. It doesn't work. So don't try it. But yeah. Yeah. That's what I'd say. Yeah. That's awesome. The the four things that my goalie coach says is take command in, in your craft, yep. be confident, play loose and relaxed and play just play simple because yep. it's amazing how things can go when you just keep everything simple and keep everything in control of what you're what you're capable of absolutely those are great points great points yeah so uh, my final question for you is college, college hockey like the fan sections are are insane it's like what has been like the the craziest thing you've heard a fan section chant or say or whatever <laughs> Yeah, I'll try and uh, I'll try and keep them PG because sometimes they don't become it. Uh, yeah. PG, but college hockey's nuts. College hockey's nuts. I've been I've seen so many hockey arenas. College hockey's nuts. We are our marching band, our cheerleaders, our student section. It is the crazy. I can't wait for October 9th to see it again. We miss it so much. When you play in Western Michigan, they have, their crowd section is called the Lunatics. Um, they have a smaller barn. They're all kind of like on top of you. It's a little more like a junior arena, but their student section makes up for it. Their student section is like half of their crowd, and, um, and, and they're, they're aggressive. They're outrageous. And so whoever your number four is on the team, no matter when they touch the puck all game, they say four is a B word. Or is a B word, or is a B word, no matter what, as loud as they can, no matter who's in that. But I remember for me personally, I was standing um, about to sing the national anthem and it was quiet. And I was the closest one to the glass of their whole entire student section on our side. And I remember uh, one guy said, Pat's a virgin. Bah, bah, bah. And the next time he said it, he must have been the one leading it. All 500 of them. Of them that's all first and you know the guys are getting a kick out of it the other team is gonna kick it out i was like it was my freshman year i was like oh my god man like i was happy to be going on trips and i was like this is brutal the guys are gonna give it to me forever but so that was probably uh that was probably the best one for me personally the student section are unbelievable man college hockey such an experience like it, it's it's awesome but that one was a funny one for me dude. yeah that, that's hilarious that's what college hockey is all about the fan sections uh, and the yeah. the hockey of course and just like more so the fan sections because you never know what you're gonna get from those chants absolutely that's crazy it's crazy yeah absolutely so uh 
Ben, this has been so much fun. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate appreciate your time. I want to wish you the best of luck going forward with the season. And I look forward to following your career the rest of the way. And hopefully I get out to a UMD game sometime this year, if fans are allowed, of course. Yeah, listen, man, thank you so much for having me. I uh, I appreciate it. Like I said to you earlier, I love what you're doing. I love the uh, love the work eth- effort. Keep going, work ethic. And uh, I appreciate it. I wish you the best of luck, too, because I know you're on a journey of your own. And and, and I wish you luck, man. Just keep, keep on battling.